so um, uh, actually, it's very interesting that I think it's the second time I get to introduce Guillermo uh, this same month. Uh, yes. So Guillermo uh, is a uh, the James Duke professor at Duke University. Uh, he received his degrees from the Technion in Israel, and he works on the theory and applications of computer vision, computer graphics, medical imaging, image analysis, and machine learning. He is uh, co-authored over 450 papers in these areas and uh, written a book uh, that was published in 2001. Uh, two weeks ago, in fact, I introduced him. He was the plenary speaker at Mikai, and he was uh, speaking about the development of an autism app uh, that was highlighted as one of the top health apps uh, in the Apple Store. Um, he's received really a, a very large number of awards for his work, including being an ONR Investigator Award, a Presidential Early Career Award, um, as well as um, being a Fellow of SIAM, a Test of Time Awards at ICCV and ICML. And he's also uh, was elected uh, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is the founding editor in chief of the SIAM Journal on Imaging Sciences. Guillermo, a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So I'm gonna, the, the biggest uh, uh, challenge in these talks is to stay one hour with no challenges from AT&T dropping my my uh, Zoom, but hopefully we work fine. So I'm going to be talking about a, a minimax Pareto fairness. Towards the end, we're going to talk about blind Pareto fairness. And uh, although it's about fairness, uh, you're going to see very soon that it's about robustness, and and that kind of kind of relates to the previous talk. But the issue of fairness is very connected to the issue of robustness. And as well as topics related to causality, which will come in a second, uh, an announcement. So this is mostly the work uh, of, of, of two of my very brilliant students, Natalia and Martin. Uh, they gave an outstanding ICML talk, and I just have the pleasure now to present again. But uh, uh, before I go into the topic, let me just mention that this Friday during the discussions, we have two outstanding speakers, uh, Solon and Anna Andrea, um, and I really invite you to come to their talk. So there's going to be uh, about 30 minutes each, and then we're going to discuss. And, and as I say, Solon is going to be talking more about counterfactual explanations. And of course, he's just a, a big name in, in, in fairness, and, and so is uh, uh, Anne Andrea, and, and I really hope that you can join us for, for lunch or post lunch. So I'm going to just split the talk like in two and a half parts. First, I'm going to give an overview about the motivation uh, and the general overview of the problem. Then I'm going to go into details. And then at the end, uh, I'm going to describe our new work on blind furners or, or furners with no demographics. And it's going to be very clear there why that's very, very connected to, to what we believe are new directions uh, in robustness of, of, of learning. So there is a tremendous amount of literature and, and superb talks on the web and on YouTube about fairness. So, so if you really want to learn more, these are just samples of the work uh, that are closely related to ours. And most of the people that I put their names here, know about fairness much more than we know, uh, which has started to work this year uh, from, from a slightly different perspective than most of the literature. So let me just uh, 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 say that our focus is, for the first part of the talk, is on characterizing optimal solutions of fairness, uh, meaning they would be on the Pareto front. And for those that are not familiar with Pareto fronts, it will be explained. And the key goal here is to do fairness without unnecessary harm. And here is a more a philosophical point of view that many in the community uh, explain, is that it, we as machine learning people, our goal is to provide the tools and to provide the explanations to the policy makers. And we're gonna show here, as well as others have shown, that sometimes requesting a, a perfect fairness in whatever definition you do of fairness actually comes at harm 
of one group without necessarily improving for the other group. And I don't believe it's our job to make the decision, it's our job to inform that decision and work together with policymakers for that. And that's very important to make sure when are we doing the best for all the protected groups without hurting anybody. And, and Rene mentioned our work in autism. Autism is significantly more diagnosed for male than female. That doesn't mean that to make to match the disparity, we should stop doing diagnosis on male. That will be basically doing harm without necessarily improving the protected group. So I'm gonna be using a few uh, 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 figures to explain this uh, in, the in the next couple of slides. Then we're gonna have a few formulas, but not, not too much uh, because I wanna try to stay at the intuitive level. Let's assume that we have two populations. And we're gonna start talking about a standard tool in, in machine learning, which is multi-objective optimization. So we have basically the risk for population zero and the risk for population one. There is the perfect fairness line where basically I have equal risk for both population. Let's say that that's my, my goal of fairness. And then there is a Pareto curve the Pareto curve basically says that all these points here, look what happened. If I get on top of the Pareto curve, I'm basically not improving on population zero, I'm getting worse on population one. So it basically means nonsense. I can achieve this, but nobody's winning. And this is all the non-feasible region. So basically uh, I cannot uh, do better than the Pareto. So you cannot be here and here makes nonsense to be. So that's the Pareto curve in just layman words. So let's just use this figure to illustrate a few other additional concepts. A naive classifier will be on the Pareto curve. And also the equal risk are all the points. And this will be the point on equal risk. It cannot be here because that's an unfeasible and it makes no sense to be here because you're gonna be increasing a cost a risk for one population without a, a, a improving the other. This is a necessary, what we call a necessary harm. So basically this is the point that we're gonna to try to find, which is the point on the Pareto curve that is as close as possible to the equal risk line. And why do we call, we and in the literature, this is called a necessary harm. If I was here and I'm trying to go to this line, I had to jump here. So I increase the risk for this. So this is paying a higher price and I'm not doing anything beneficial to this population. So basically in order to force myself to have equal risk, I'm harming one of the populations without helping the other. And that's what we call unnecessary harm. And the idea will be to find this point and we're gonna have a few uh, uh, points on theory about that. And then, as I say, work together with policymakers is this jump needs to be made. So let me just give you an example in general. There is a lot of disparities in salaries. And let's say that a, a group is, makes 20, a year, another one makes 25 a year. So you could do harm and going down, let's say from 25 to 20 and be very perfect, perfectly fair. Or maybe there is a solution that puts the 20 in 21, the 25 in 23. So there is still a gap, but both populations are making more money than they were making with the perfect fairness. And that's the, tri the concept that we're trying to bring here. So how are we gonna do this? And again, I'm giving the overview and I'm gonna go in details. If the the multi-objective optimization problem is minimizing all the risk. So this is the number of protected groups that we have. What we're gonna to try to do, which is the minimax Pareto fairness, is we're gonna find the learning system that is on the Pareto curve. So it belongs to the Pareto 
that is the one that minimizes the maximal error. So we basically look at all the protected groups. And in this part of the talk, I'm assuming that I know what training the protected groups, female, male, or, 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 or different ethnicities. We don't have to know that anymore at the, at the testing time, but we assume we know at the training time. So we look at all the protected groups. We look which one is being hurt the most. And then we try to minimize that. So it's a min max approach. So that's a basic idea. Now let me just go a bit in details, formulating this, giving you some theoretical foundations and how we actually optimize, giving you some results. And then I'm going to discuss the future work, which is what happens when we don't know even at training the groups to protect. And that's what relates to a, to a, a kind of a new direction in, in robustness. So we have the standard setting. We have the data X, the label Y, and A is the protective groups. Might be two groups, five groups, seven groups. We are going to see that. We have our hypothesis class, for example, a DNN classifier a neural network. We have a loss function. And then we have the population risk, the risk for each one of the classes. A regular multi-objective optimization problem will try to minimize all the risks. So that's standard in the literature. This here we have formally are defining the Pareto hypothesis, which is basically all the classifiers, assume that you are working with an error network, all the classifiers that basically any other classifier will perform a worst in at least one of the groups. So basically, you, you're, as I say on the graph, you're on the Pareto curve. Everything else you do outside of that, at least one of the groups will be hurt most. And then you have the risks that corresponds to the Pareto hypothesis. So you have all the classifiers that can achieve a point here. So that's the Pareto hypothesis and then the corresponding risks. And our proposal is the minimax Pareto fair model that says you need to be from all the potential classifiers, you find the one that pushes down the worst group that you're doing. So you have, let's say two groups or let's say five groups and for every classifier, you compute the risk. And you say, I'm going to try to push down the one that is performing the worst. And we repeat here the figure that we had before. I want to give you the, there is also the utopia point, which is basically the point that is minimum for both, that, that you can do the best possible there. And that's not necessarily achievable. We are going to be in part of our theory shows when actually this utopia point is achievable. If, so again, all these points make nonsense because you're doing unnecessary harm. This is the best you can do being on this curve. And the closest to the perfect uh, equality is this point. And here we have, the again, the utopia point. So let me just mention a couple because part of this work is to characterize the type of solutions. So first, if by chance equal risk is Pareto, then it is a solution to this problem. So basically, if this line intersects the Pareto curve, we will find it. It's part of the solution. So that's one result that we show. But here comes another result, which I think is very important in practice. So one of the ways to achieve fairness is to add noise to your system. And there's excellent works on how to do that. We actually show that let's assume that we find this minimax Pareto, but you're not happy. The, the, basically, the policy says you have to achieve perfect fairness, so you have to be here. It turns out that this is the best point to start from adding the noise. So not only is the best point that causes no harm be, meaning that outside of this, you're going to start doing harm, and this is going to be the, ha the gap. But this is also the best initial condition for adding the noise in case 
you want perfect fairness. So this is actually very two very important results of, about this framework that we are addressing. One says that if by any chance you could achieve perfect fairness, you will find it on the Pareto. And the other is that I'm not only giving you the one that basically is the best solution without any harm, it's also the best starting point to move forward. So that's part of the characterization. The other, the other part of the characterization is the following. If your space of if algorithms is convex, and, and this is, needs a clarification, I'm not saying that a neural network is convex, but the space of neural networks is convex. For example, neural networks are a convex hypothesis test. It turns out that your best classifier is the one that optimizes this linear combination, which is a linear combination on the risks of every single one of the protected classes. So we fully characterize the general form of the best classifier on the Pareto curve. And we go a bit forward, a, a, a bit further, and if you use standard a, a penalty functions a, like cross entropy or the beer score, we have a full characterization of the best classifier and also the risk. And they're very intuitive because they are linear combinations of the probability of the point belonging to the class with the optimal label. And once again, the risk are basically nothing else than the best solutions that you can achieve, as you see here, and the distance that you have from the optimal classifier to basically the perfect classifier. So, so for convex hypothesis class, we have a full characterization of the algorithm, meaning the best that you can achieve. And in the cases of cross entropy or, or, or similar relationship for Breer score, which are traditional scores in fairness as well, you have a full characterization and a very intuitive characterization, both of the best algorithm and actually the error that you're doing. And once again, the error is very intuitive, is how well you achieve basically the optimum, uh, which is kind of that utopia point uh, that, that we, we, we mentioned before. That will give, as I will show in a second, a very nice algorithm to actually show, to compute this optimum, because all what we're going to be needing is to compute these coefficients. Before I go into that, let me just mention two additional uh, uh, things that we have shown in the characterization of this Pareto uh, fairness. One is that if you're uh, 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 basically, uh, if, if your label is independent of the class, you're going to achieve it. So, so basically, you're going to get to the best. And, and, and achieve basically perfect balance. So basically the solution to the problem is the best solution for each one. And the same happens if you actually have full information about the protected classes from the image. So if you, if you can fully infer the, from the protected class, from the data, if you can fully infer from the data X, the protected class, or if your labels, are independent of the protected class given the data, then there is no trade-offs. So basically, you're gonna uh, uh, basically you're not gonna be paying a price to protect one. You're not gonna be paying a price on the other. So so this provides a full, um, a very uh, comprehensive characterization of the type of solutions that once again they're achieving the best fairness classifier that you can achieve without causing any harm to any group. How do we compute it? We compute it based on this property that we found that it's going to have to find just the coefficients. That's how we are going to work here. And for that, we actually prove additional uh, uh, properties and these are two of the additional properties. The previous properties were, were very generic. These are 
also general, but they're geared towards finding an algorithm. And the first property basically says that uh, the, the solution set for each one of the, of the protected groups, meaning the mu coefficients for each one of the protected groups is an A star shape set. And that will give us immediately that what we are trying to find is the intersection of star shape shapes. So the same way that you have intersection of convex sets, and there is a full literature on optimization towards the intersection of convex sets or so projection onto convex sets. Here, we're going to be looking at the projection onto the intersection of star shape. Uh, sets. And once again, we prove that, that these sets are star shaped. So for every one of the protected classes, the allow mu are inside a star shape. And then we have another result that gives us the direction to move that says the non zero coefficients of this mu coefficient that we are finding has to be actually on the union of the non zero star shape sets. So these two give us a basically conditions to find the coefficients. Remember this formula, all what I need to find are the coefficients. And uh, so we, we, have, we, we have the direction to go until we get into the intersection. And this is just three, an, an example for, with, with three different, it's an artificial example. And then we're gonna be doing moving towards the union from the second part of the theorem and trying to get to the intersection. The, we don't have a full proof of convergence of this, so, so, so that's an open question. I'm going to come back later. So once again, this will give us at the end, as this a, a path into star shape sets will give us the best solution that is not hurting any one of the protected groups. It's not necessarily giving us perfect fairness. We have the previous results that says, when are we gonna achieve perfect fairness? The utopia point has to be on the, on the Pareto and we gave the conditions of orthogonality or, or full information. So there normally will be a gap and we're gonna see that on the results. So let me just give you a couple of results. This is a kind of an artificial example, those that you create to evaluate your algorithm. A, a P star is, is our algorithm that is doing projection onto star shape sets. And these are two uh, other popular algorithms. And this depends on the areas that we create on the star shape. And you always see that we basically converge faster than, than the given literature thanks to the fact that we fully characterized the space of solutions so we can exploit that into our algorithm. The other algorithms are more generic in that sense. And just to give you a couple of examples, uh, uh, these are all standard data sets, so don't, don't blame them on, on me. These are standard data sets in the, in the fairness literature. In this case, there are eight sensitive groups. All my graphs were with two, but, but these are eight. And, and I want you to, so there is multiple algorithms. And let's just concentrate first on, the, on this half. This is our algorithm. And higher here is better, so it's accuracy. And this is the worst group. So once again, remember, we're doing a min max. We're trying to say the group the protected group that is affected the most, we're trying to push that down. And then we see that when we look at the worst group, some of the state of the art are actually hurting significantly one of the groups in order to achieve this fairness. And we get a basic state of the art results on that. And also the disparity, meaning the error in performance between the groups is not zero. Because in this case, my hyperplane that is perfect fairness is not intersecting the Pareto. So I'm actually getting the smallest possible. So remember on the Pareto, I'm getting into that point is the smallest possible uh, distance to the perfect fairness. Uh, uh, so we're getting the best performance for the worst group, 
Uh, we also get, a, a, sometimes we don't have to get the best performance for the mean because that's not what we're trying to average, but we get, we are protecting the worst performing group the best and we are minimizing the disparity. And then you can start adding noise uh, following hard uh, from there and, and try to be a bit more fair. So you see disparities going from 7.1 to 11.4 without really affecting too much actually the worst group. So remember, we proved that that point that is the closest point to perfection is also the best point to start adding noise, moving more towards per perfection. Here is another a, a standard a case, which is the, the skin lesion. In this case, a, 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 you know, we, we don't need the protected a group at testing time. In this case, actually the protected group is the output. So you will never have it. Um, and once again, you see that we have a, a very good performance and we are, a, this is the Braille score. So lower is better. A, a good performance and very small disparity. And then if you look at the accuracy, we have the best performance for the worst group. So this is the one that is doing the worst and, and also the, 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 the best uh, uh, disparity between accuracy. Here is disparity between the barrier score and here is disparity between the accuracy. So we are seeing these examples, both that we are not hurting as much the worst group as others are, and, and that we are getting as close as possible to the perfect equality. So if you are now a machine learning person informing policy, you say, this is the best disparity you can get. From now on, if you wanna shrink this, you're gonna start hurting performance to potentially all the groups. So nobody's gonna actually benefit from this. So some will stay the same, some will get worse, you are not helping anybody by just doing this parity reduction. And I think it's a very important lesson to, to policy uh, uh, makers. Let me just, before I go into the blind, let me just give you a conclusion about this. And then I, one slide about the, the blind fairness and, 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 and robustness. So what I have shown you is how we recover the best, as I say a minute ago, the algorithm that will give you the best performance for the most hurt protected group, which is as close as possible to perfect fairness. We fully characterize, not we fully, we, we comprehensively characterize, there's always more that you can do, the type of solutions. And then we provided AP star as an algorithm to address this. We don't have a convergence proof for AP star, we have observation. I think that's an interesting, and, and people in the audience that, that know more optimization than me, maybe they can point us out to literature on, on optimization onto star shape and not convex shapes. So it's a bit a, a, a broader a, a, a set. We, are, a, a, we wanna identify high risk subpopulations automatically uh, uh, and that relates to the next point. So, so two more slides and then I'm gonna wrap up for questions. So this is new work that we just finished or we just finished the first part. We never finished working. And, and it's again with Natalia and Martin, but also with Aphrodite and Miguel from UCL. So here comes the questions. What if I don't know a training the protected groups? It's not that, that basically I don't give you the variable and there is a lot of work on trying to use proxies for that variable. Let's say that you wanna protect male and female, but I give you a population, I don't tell you if they are male or female, but you can try to guess from the other data to try to infer that, and this is a big issue on privacy. We're trying to go one step more. What if I don't even know them today? So today I might wanna protect male and female, deploy my algorithm, and then tomorrow somebody wants to use the algorithm to protect a elderly. And somebody else wants to use the algorithm to protect everybody that lives in Durham. And somebody else, everybody that lives in John Hopkins. So I have to deploy an algorithm that everybody can use to protect their own group. So not the group that I designed, not the group that the data explicitly uh, uh, infers, 
you decide the group. And then we develop an algorithm that instead of min max has another max and says, okay, let's try not to optimize that we push down the best, the worst protected group. Let's try to push down every subgroup that you can infer. Every single subgroup that comes to your mind of certain size, of course, that comes to your mind we try to push down. And, and I can give the details, but let me just exemplify what we're getting with this graph. So once again, before we say, okay, you give me 10 subgroups, 10 protected groups, and I'm gonna make sure that I push the worst performing as down as possible. Here, I have no clue. I have to basically push down every subgroup that let's say contain 10% of the data. You tell me I need to protect every subgroup of 10% of the data. And this is what this is very important related to, to robustness. Normally in the machine learning, and there are a few exceptions coming out now, in the machine learning we do average. So ImageNet we do average, but there might be one class that basically if, if, if I do terrible. And maybe I design the class. Maybe I take three of the cows, five of the cars, and, and seven uh, of the houses. And I say, just because I like it, I want that subgroup to be robust as well. And this is related to what's called gerrymandering in, in robustness that the UPenn group is, is, is leading in that aspect. So we want to try to be robust to any subgroup. And let me just show you here what we can achieve with the algorithm that we designed. And there is a number of graphs here. So we, we have what, what we call the blind Pareto fairness now. And the red will be the result of this algorithm that basically a, a, a tries to be robust to any side group and fair to any side group on a particular group that you tell me. You say, hey, you try to be robust to everybody, but I only care about this subgroup. And so this is the red curve, the continuous red. We are basically this dash red. So we are basically saying, you know, by trying to be robust to everybody of size that we see on the horizontal axis, I actually look, the, the two red lines are very close. I didn't lose too much for you. So actually the fact that you knew your protected group didn't help much. I can achieve almost the same result. On the other hand, I'm, I'm, this actually is, is basically a, the, the continuous uh, black is actually again on a predefined partition, but I'm gonna contrast the red which is what we achieve with the dash black. The dash black says, what happened if I target to protect a group and then I look for another group of the same size, let's say 40% of the data, which I didn't try in advance to protect. So let's say that my population is half elderly and half young, half male and half female. So you try to protect male and female and you get the red. But then I decide to look at the young and elderly. I do tremendously worse on protecting them. So, and, and this is this graph. So of the same size, while you're trying to protect one group, you are hurting many other groups of the same size. Contrary to that, if you follow the theory and the framework that we present in this paper, which I would be happy to share uh, uh, with, with the audience. If we try to protect all the subgroups, we achieve uh, basically this dash and it's not very far to what you would have achieved by giving me in advance your group. So it's much better to try to be robust to everybody. You don't lose a lot and you don't risk hurting one group that somebody can decide in the future. Once again, this was motivated by fairness, but I think it's a very important concept in subgroup robustness. 
The graph on the right is just another example of how important is Pareto. Uh, we are here, and these are all points that you're gonna get if you don't try to be Pareto using the same issue of trying to be robust for all the subgroups, you're always gonna be to the right. So you're always gonna be hurting some of the groups without really helping anybody. So it's very important on these optimizations that when we're doing fairness or when we're doing subgroup robustness, that not only we try to be very good for the subgroups, but just make sure that you are Pareto because otherwise you're hurting others without benefiting. And I think that's an important concept for the community as well. We're not the only ones, uh, as I said, the group at Penn uh, on, on, on fairness and privacy is, is very strong on, on this group. So for the first part, we have, we have code uh, available uh, uh, on, on, on Natalia's GitHub, uh, but I'm gonna stop here and, and just take any, any questions that the audience might have. I don't even know what time it is, but uh, Oh, I'm, I'm very good on time. I want people to rest before going to Soledad. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Guillermo. That was really a fantastic talk. Uh, there are many questions uh, on the chat already, so let me begin with the first one. Um, Alejandro uh, asks uh, the following. In, in all of the curves that you showed, uh, the geometry of the Pareto region is such that at some point, uh, the borders become parallel to the axis. How do you know that this is actually the case? Oh, we, so first of all, we, we have characterized when the Pareto curve is convex. So that should be the first question. It's not always convex and it's not always parallel uh, uh, to the axis. So, so just those are drawings, but, but it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be uh, parallel, but, and it doesn't have to be convex either, but we characterize and others have characterized conditions to, to achieve convexity. So maybe, Maybe, uh, Alejandro, you're right. It, it's always bad when you do a, an artificial drawing that actually gives hints of properties that do not have to happen. So maybe we need to draw a more crazy Pareto curve just to show that it doesn't have to be convex or, or, or any property. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good but, point. But even in that curve, um, I think your main point about the no harm was exactly that you are axis aligned and therefore there is this vertical slope. Uh, but if, if the slope was not as such, then the no harm wouldn't be true anymore, right? No, because it doesn't have to be, so I can, I can finish my Pareto curve. Just look at the point. The point, and, and again, first of all, most of the examples I gave are actually in seven or eight dimensions. So that is not, so basically we achieve a point that is the closest point on the Pareto curve. Just think any curve is the closest point on the Pareto curve to, to basically the perfect fairness line. That's, that's the, the whole geometry. Maybe the geometry there was oversimplified. Okay. Yeah. I see that Soledad is on the line, so maybe you can, just ask the next question directly, Soledad. Yeah, hi. Uh, so yeah, my, my question was related to what you just said, like how general is the convexity assumption and like, do you have scenarios where like you can increase a little bit, uh, you can increase a lot the, the accuracy for one class, but you need to decrease a little bit the accuracy for the other classes. Yeah, so that would depend both on the, on the hypothesis classes that you're taking uh, uh, that will depend on the on the cost function, and and there are there are conditions. But but what your what your question goes to, let's say okay, we have conditions for convexity, but but I think part of your question is, can I learn something more about the shape of the Pareto curve in general, the slope of the Pareto curve? You know how. A, a, how smooth it is, and and I think it's a great question. Uh, we only address convexity, but it's a, it's a great question. Uh, even you know how smooth from the point of view of how stable it is. You know what happens if my algorithm is just a bit noisy? My levels are a bit noisy. Will I be on a completely different level? So I think that's a great question. I should ask that to the to the items. By the way, there might be some uh, stronger results in the literature because Pareto curves is a very common tool in the economics literature. So there might be more results about the characterization of the shape of the Pareto front. We shouldn't call it Pareto curve because it might be multiple dimensions of the Pareto front. I think it's a great question, great question. Yeah. 
Um, if there are any other questions, please um, feel free to just put them on the chat. Um, in, for, in the before, before you ask, for those that don't know, you do have to ask another question because Soledad Alejandro and myself were born in the same country. Uh, so this starts to look like a mafia if you don't ask any other question. Uh, uh, so, so, so you must ask. Uh, the only reason Alejandro and Soledad are asking is because they, they know I'm nice to them, because, but, but please ask questions. By okay, the way, so let me just, be, because I didn't, I only- that, uh, Your assessment is incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm never nice to them. Uh, so I don't let know. me just think. He didn't qualify. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 I didn't mention a lot about uh, the blind uh, fairness because I added that slide in. As I say, it's very recent work. But I should mention that there is uh, this work of, of subgroup robustness is starting to appear. It's one of the things like everybody gets to the challenge at the same time. So there is a, a really fantastic paper by the group of Chris Ray uh, on the topic, another fantastic paper by, by uh, the group of, of uh, uh, Duki uh, on that. And there is another great paper by a group in Columbia about touching all these issues about uh, subgroup robustness and, and blind fairness. And there is a lot of group, a lot of work on fairness without demographics, basically that do not go into completely the subgroup, but they do mention, okay, what happened if I don't give you the demographics and, and there is a large range, there is a paper by Maya Gupta and, 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 and Michael Jordan at this narrative. So there, there is a, please do not believe that all this is, you know, our contributions are, were stated here, but there is a fantastic literature in the subject and, and there start to appear a lot of literature that connects a, a fairness with subgroup robustness, which I think is, is, is very exciting. Um, there is another question uh, from Rujana Baichi. Uh, great, to, great to see you, Rujana. So you mentioned that you were not necessarily happy with the data sets that were available. You said you just had to use them. So she asked, what kind of data would you like to see collected? So great. The, the reason I say is because some of those data sets are very controversial by themselves, uh, like the, the data set of, uh, that is very commonly used in the fairness about the, the chances of, of basically getting a loan or going back to jail or they, they have their own problems as data sets and their own ethical problems as well. Uh, I would like a lot uh, many more data sets were harm, uh, although in a lot of things, uh, uh, harm is, is very critical, but in, in medicine, there is harm is very uh, uh, critical because it's your health. But, but here comes a point, and I'm gonna just give it the, the work that we're doing in autism to exemplify this. And, and it's a problem that maybe will be discussed on Friday with Solon that is, it has a fantastic background and many more time and years than me in the field. In autism research today, the diagnosis is four times to one male to female ratio. So four times to one, the diagnosis. All the experts believe that that diagnosis is bias, but it's actually not known yet what is the quote-unquote the true ratio and it's believed that it's about two to one that basically the, that the prevalence of autism in an ideal world is about two times more on male than female so a first system will be a system that diagnosed two to one today we're diagnosing four to one how we design a first system that actually this two to one is not even known today, it's just, you know, it's a guess. So how do we get data sets that even the best point of fairness is not known? And those are data sets that I think will challenge us, data scientists, to provide not solutions, but information to policymakers. Because the perfect fairness, and, and, and there are many talks out there that there is no one definition. By the way, there is multiple definitions of fairness, and there are theorems that show that you cannot accomplish all of them at the same time. 
So that reinforces more that our job is to inform policymakers. And I would like to see more of those data sets where the protected groups and the perfect fairness is not even known. It's just, it's just a, a concept. And then it will force us to be more informative and more interpretable in our, in our solutions. Great, that's a really great example. Next question from Juan Servino. Uh, how do you know which group is the one that is harmed the most? And okay, what is let the me relation? just, yeah, let me just give you on the second part on the blind. Basically the algorithm is kind of a game theory. It, 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 the, the first, so the one player is doing the Pareto is saying, okay, I'm gonna try, let's say that I start randomly and I create groups. So, so the one player does the Pareto and says, okay, I'm gonna just do the min max Pareto on you. And that's the, the AP star algorithm I mentioned. And then there is the, the adversary and let's say, okay, now I know your algorithm. I'm gonna create a group. You told me of size 10%. I'm gonna create a group that you're hurting the most. How do I do that? I go over all your data. I rank them on worst to best and I cut at 10%. So I just created a group that you're hurting the most. And then again, the other player will try to do min max Pareto on that group. And then you keep, you keep going around. So that's kind of one way of, of doing that there. Hi, Guillermo. Uh, this is Yi. I have a quick Hi. question. Yeah. Hi. So, um, so you you keep mentioning that the you know we the all this fairness analysis is really for policy making right um so uh, one particular maybe easy to collect data is maybe say admission you know student admission or you know now people using ai for a job screening you know resume so one particular question is that so we we're facing the decision making for example uh, you say you are trying to decide if we're going to use gre score right so right now you are in a setting that all the features are already decided for you. So you try to de design a classifier or you know fair to all the groups. What if you know sometimes the decision making have to interfere, right? What you know play in the decision making? The features, which one do you take out? Would that uh, harm certain group or not? Uh, how do you you know in your framework how this kind of um, feature selection or decision making the loop of fairness? We can. Okay, great. I'm not going to answer. Uh, so first of all, you know, it's Soledad is going to answer that in her talk. <laughs> no, I'm not going to answer because Solon is going to talk about that on Friday. That's going to be his talk about counterfactual and how they might be misleading. Oh, that he has a fantastic paper on that, and that's going to be his paper and part of the discussion on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, I have to be very careful because one of the most famous cases of unfairness uh, was uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, that, that uh, one of the most studied cases of fairness or unfairness with, with very prestigious professors defending both sides. Uh, but, but you're right. And, and I can imagine that, and as I say, part of our job is to work with policymakers and not say this is a fair solution. So I could imagine that I could train algorithms where I'm dropping certain uh, uh, variables and then uh, basically seeing the disparities and the results and the risk for each one of the groups. But I think it, to my understanding, this is a big part of, of, of uh, the talk on Friday uh, because Solon is gonna talk about you know, this counterfactual explainable mm -hmm. features, how sometimes they can actually uh, uh, work not perfectly with, with the expectations. So I think it's, it's a great segue for, for, for the panel and the session on, on Friday. But let me tell you in case it was, I wasn't clear, I think our job as data scientists is not to make the decision, but to work with policymakers and to be able to, in the simplified case I mentioned, to say, this is the best you can do from, from now on, you're gonna hurt one of the groups. Is that worth doing fairness or not? So, so do, do I go with $20 for everybody or I'd rather go 21 and 23 and live with the unfairness? 
we need to present that data and not make that decision. And there is many papers in the community that try to take the, the hat of the policymaker and say, this is what needs to be done. And I think that we need to be a bit more uh, 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 humble in that and, and just uh, doing, and I know Soledad is gonna be talking about interpretation yeah. and stuff. That's, that's one of the areas I think is important for us to just provide the information we can provide and then also be uh, humble in what we cannot say. So it's, uh, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's a common sense, right? I mean, people, the equality is not a fairness. Right? So this is a, uh, but somehow, you know, sometimes that, that, that common sense can get lost in the social. In yeah, the so I, I give the example of autism, you know, if for some reason, this is an area we work alone a lot. And, and there are the, the experts tell me that they believe they know why this four to one disparity. But that doesn't mean that we should stop and we should just move it to two to one. No, we should work harder on get to the two to one without hurting the boys that are properly diagnosed. Yeah. We, we will be unfair for a while but we have to be consciously unfair. We have to admit that we are being unfair because we don't have knowledge to be fair, but mm -hmm. we shouldn't be hurting one group because we don't know how to help the other. Yeah. And we should also not, in my opinion, we should also not say, oh, I don't know, so I'm living with that. We should be keep working on, on shrinking the gap the most we can, but not put one on the side because we don't know how to shrink that gap. So I think it's, and, and many of the speakers, and I think we're gonna, with the center that Rene is leading, hopefully we're also gonna go in those directions about basically more communication with the people that are using our machine learning. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. by the way, just as my last comment, this is partially what motivates the last part about the blind is because we don't know how people are gonna use our machine learning. So we try to be fair to whatever subgroup you define. You are the user. Who am I to tell you that this is the group that you need to protect? You are the user. And machine learning is very used to train and test on the same data and then extend to meta learning and extend to transfer learning and all the variations. In the blind, we're going a step beyond. We are saying nobody knows today, what is the group that a group that a person tomorrow will care about? So we need to be even more broad than that. Okay, good, thanks. Great. Um, I want to go back to the question from Juan Servino. Uh, he had actually two questions and I'm not so sure if you answered both of them. So the first one I think is how do you find the group uh, that is harmed the most? But the second one was, what is the relationship with the amount of samples you have available from this group? Oh, uh, in our, oh, great, great. In the paper on the blind uh, uh, fairness, so I think there is two parts of that question. One is, you know, the, which I'm not an expert is, you know, how many uh, samples you need to learn and all that. But in the blind, we actually have a theorem that says, below this size the best so we have a bound on the size that we can achieve and below that size actually the best you can do is be random so the the bound is explicit there they say if you get below this if you just decide so let me just give you an example you know how you can be completely unfair take all your data and put in one group all the points that you make a mistake for them. And in another group, all the points that you're right. So you're completely unfair to one group because you have 100% error in one group, 0% error on the other group, okay? So you have to control for those things. And then we have issues about size in the paper. And then we show that, that basically a random classifier is the best you can do below that size. So, so that's a... Uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, that answers partially that question. So, so, so Juan, happy to send you the, 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 the paper. Uh, 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 and, and uh, you know, like every reasonable good paper should uh, open more questions than it should answer. So I think that we're opening 
from the feedback, we're opening more questions than what we answer there. Uh, so so I'm, I'm happy happy to share uh, uh, that that preprint. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's a, actually it's always good to remember that if you allow me to pick any group, and this is addressed by the people that do fantastic work on the gerrymandering of fairness. If you allow me to pick any group, I will pick all your mistakes. And then the, imagine that our average undergraduate was our actually fail exams and not all the exams. So we will all fail. So that's very unfair. Um, so uh, continuing on the question of how you solve the, the problem in, in here, and, and maybe, maybe what I'm gonna say makes no sense. I'm just thinking for the first time about this, but um, I'm not so sure if the way in which you're doing the optimization in the blind case is necessarily the best one. And it occurred to me that because you don't know which groups, it may connect, for example, to what one used to do in, in sparsity, where you can select all of the groups of a certain size in a certain sense. And then the extension of a sparsity, which was group sparsity, uh, that I think, for example, Francis Back had a, a bunch of papers on, uh, that you could get convex relaxation of those, uh, of those norms that you impose over a, a set of given set of potential groups. Do you think that uh, there are, that this would be usable uh, within the, the problem you're solving or, or is too far from what you're doing? So that's very interesting. Uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, I think uh, Martina and Natalia are not in because you guys know that in the next hours you have to upload your video for your NeurIPS paper. Uh, so they're, they're working on that. Uh, uh, on the uploading their video. So first of all, the algorithm we do converges and that's because it's a class of algorithms that have been studied before. So we know convergence, we have a convergence proof for that. But what you're saying, it never occurred to me, it looks like I forgot my past. But what you're saying is that the group is like detecting the active set in sparse modeling and instead of L0, we use an L1 why don't we try to, to use an L1 to find the group? I think it's an interesting question. I don't have an answer. I will, if they were here, I will ask them if they thought in that direction, but, but we need to come back to you. What you're saying is don't find, the, don't find the, the worst group, the L0, just find the L1 in some way or another. And maybe you get, first, maybe you get a better algorithm. Maybe you can prove that under certain conditions, L0 and L1 are equivalent as they are in the, for let's say random matrices in compressed sensing or stuff. I think it's a great question. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I, I, will, be, I will be back. Uh, so you can put that in another uh, topic that we need to address in our center. Yeah, that's a great question. Great question. Great, thank you. Uh, so on that note, uh, let me just quote again someone from the audience. Great talk, Guillermo. I learned something new today. 